Hi, what's up? Welcome to this video where I'm gonna talk about every single thing that I did to launch my silly little art shop. For those of you who don't know, hi, I'm Licha. I'm an illustrator slash designer slash art person on the internet. And recently I did a whole series of vlogs of me prepping to launch and launching my art shop. And while I was doing that, I was looking for a lot of resources of like how to launch a online art shop or like what to do, like a checklist maybe would be helpful. And I found it really hard to find something that was like very, the bullet points and like every single thing that you need to do in your shop prep slash shop opening journey. There's definitely lots of resources out there, but it seemed like I needed to kind of pull from lots of different sources. So I thought it would be helpful to put together a very thorough, very in-depth video of going through every single thing that I did from start to finish to launch my art shop. So yeah, that's this video. <laughs> it's gonna be a long one, I think. I have lots of notes. I'll try to go quick, but you know how I am. I, I tend to ramble. So strap in and let's get started. I'm going to leave all of my notes in the description box below the notes for this video, basically what I'm reading off of. So if you want all of this information in text form, it's literally right there. Um, I'm also going to include like more of a bullet points kind of checklist type thing. It's not going to include as many details or little tips or anything like that. But if you just want the checklist, that'll be down there as well. So yeah, I'm going to go through specific things like this, the specific services I used, programs, printers, items, whatever. I'm going to include a breakdown of my expenses. I'll talk about any insights or things that I learned along the way, things that I didn't think about, things that I couldn't find on the internet when I was looking for advice. And to put a disclaimer on top of all of this before we get started, I'm not an accountant or a pro e-commerce business person or anything like that. I have just launched an online art shop and sold some art prints. So that's my resume. <laughs> So proceed with caution <laughs> and definitely for things like taxes or, you know, things that are specific to where you live. I highly recommend that you do your own research. You kind of have to because I am based in Canada. I know a lot of you are in the States or elsewhere. So a lot of this information will be specific to Canada. So yeah, this video and all of the information below and stuff like that is just meant to be like a starting point just so that you can kind of get a grasp of like what the journey might look like, what I did what worked for me and the things that I learned along the way. So hopefully my experience hearing that will be helpful for you in your journey. Okay, <laughs> now let's get started. Okay, so the first thing that we need to do in our shop journey is to be clear on the why. This last process or whatever of me opening my shop and getting it to launch wasn't my first attempt at selling art online. I had tried opening a shop and selling some of my art on Etsy before. It really didn't do well at all. It kind of got no momentum. I didn't put much effort into it at all either. And I think I got like one or two sales or something. And so I kind of gave up on that pretty quickly. But I feel like the issue with that time is that I wasn't clear on what I wanted from it and why I was doing it. The why was kind of just like a fickle, like I just wanna make some extra side income, you know, sell some of my art that I make anyways, like print it really quick at home on my printer, whatever. Like I didn't think too much about like branding or, or marketing or, you know, making the packaging experience very like personal to me. And so I definitely got out of it what I put into it. This time around, I was trying to build this thing that I wanted to kind of grow and develop with me. I kept my expectations low and I was okay with being realistic with myself, with the shop being a bit of a slow burn. I just wanted something that existed and that was active and that was running and that people knew about that whenever I did want to, you know, sell some products or if I had an idea for some art that would be cool to sell later, I just kind of wanted this avenue to kind of be a part of my art career and my art practice and journey. And I feel like thinking of it in that sense really made the process a lot more enjoyable for me. So yeah, I feel like it's important to be very clear on your expectations, have goals for sure to strive towards and start to think about what 
other than a bit of side income, you want to get out of the shop. So one of the first things that I did when I was thinking about launching a shop was I reached out to my Instagram audience and kind of put out feelers on my story and asked questions about like what people would be interested in buying. Over the years, you know, I had gotten a few like DMs and comments and stuff like people saying like, oh, do you sell this as a print? Or I would love to buy this or blah, blah, blah. So I kind of like kept a mental note of like what types of things people were interested in. And then I used that data to decide on a launch inventory. On top of this, I was kind of keeping a like screenshot folder of other people's art shops and paying attention to what they were selling, um, what kinds of things seem to do well. Like you can go through and sometimes people leave the things that are sold out on their pages or they like list things as like bestsellers or things like that. And then you can start to really get a good understanding of what sells and what does well, balancing kind of catering to what people want and being real with yourself and like continuing to make things that you actually wanna make, you know? I feel like finding the balance between those two things is the sweet spot. So yeah, with some of that research done, I decided on my launch inventory. I plan to launch with a set of two stickers I made it a set just because for myself, I'll get into this a little later. The supplier that I went with and most sticker suppliers, it kind of seems like the production cost is a little expensive for what you would expect to pay for a sticker. For something like stickers, since they are so small, like they can't be too expensive or else they feel kind of overpriced. So putting them in a set allowed me to have the price kind of make a little bit more sense. So you had to buy them in twos and also like the two stickers were related. So they kind of made sense in a set. Six postcards and three prints. The point was to kind of keep things very small. I didn't want to launch with too many options. I wanted to keep it concise so that when people come to the shop for the first time, they wouldn't be overwhelmed with decision. All of my stuff, except for the stickers, were from already existing art. So it was easy to kind of turn into uh, print form. And then I decided on quantities of 25 each for the prints and postcards, and then 50 each for the stickers. The postcards and prints, I just, figured 25 would be good. Depending on how you decide to get your print quantities, and if you wanna go with a third party or if you wanna print it yourself, going with the third party, you have to think about quantities because typically the less you order, the more expensive it is per item. That was especially relevant for my sticker order because like I said, it is pretty expensive to produce stickers. And while stickers are a popular item, if you don't order enough, then it kind of doesn't make sense in terms of like profit versus production cost. So I landed at 50 because that felt like a good balanced number. So yeah, in hindsight, I feel like those were good quantities. I still have a bunch of postcards and stickers left over. It all depends what you want to do with that. Like leftover stock, you can definitely always put on sale later. Or if you just like never decide to close your shop, it'll just kind of remain there indefinitely. So just try and be, you know, realistic with how much of a following you have, how much effort you are willing to put in to like push your product. And yeah, just try not to overwhelm yourself. Try not to spend too much money on stock if you don't think that you can get rid of it eventually. And something else to think about pertaining to inventory is you might wanna ask yourself, do you want to launch with um, individual items or sets? I feel like uh, sets tend to do pretty well if you can you know, offer them at a discounted price. I feel like people are into that. I did end up launching with a few bundles of postcards at a pretty good discount. So that item did really well. It was one of the first things that sold out. Something to consider. And then you might want to put together a loose budget to follow. I feel like seeing what I spent will be helpful. When I thought about my initial budget, I was low. <laughs> I spent more than I thought I was going to spend, which is fine. But yeah, we'll get into that a little bit later. But pay attention to things like expensives. Try to kind of like plan out what you think you might spend. Look at prices for print shop, prices for anything else you might need, like an upfront cost, like envelopes, shipping materials, printers, things like that, just so that you can try and give yourself a snapshot of what that might look like for yourself. 
And then so once you kind of have an understanding of what you want to sell, it's time to do some research. With my inventory in mind, with my quantities in mind, or while I was deciding my quantities, I guess, I was doing research of local printers in my city, printers that exist online, and just kind of checking their prices and seeing who I wanted to go with. I wanted a balance of obviously quality, but also production cost. I ended up going with a local printer just so that I could get physical proofs and check them and I could go pick them up so I didn't have to wait so long for shipping times and things like that. The local printer that I went with for my prints is Little Rock. They're decent. The quality of the prints that I got were like mostly really good. I feel like maybe there was like miscommunication or I don't know, I didn't print on the right stock or something, but some of my prints did come back a little B grade, um, which I did end up selling at a discounted price. But um, yeah, do your research, see what's kind of in your area. And then for my stickers, I went with a printer based in Canada called Jukebox. They are located in Vancouver, so a province over. They had to ship them over, but they seem to be uh, the most affordable and high quality option for me. So based on your research of third-party printers, I know a lot of people consider and they do print themselves at home. Stickers, you can get a sticker printer in like a cry cut to cut them out and things like that. I know a lot of people do that. And me, myself, I have this printer here that I use for commissions and whenever I need to print high quality art prints. I got this prior to the whole shop thing, so this already existed, but I decided against using it to print my inventory and to print my stock just because it is a pretty big time investment printing everything one by one and cutting it myself. So I just decided to, you know, invest the money into letting somebody else do that, somebody who does that for a living, a print shop. And um, yeah, I think I'm happy with my decision to do that anyways. This printer is the Canon PIXMA Pro 100. Uh, I really like it. It pushes out really high quality prints. The higher quality though that you print, the slower it'll print and the ink is super expensive. And if you try to get a third party um, ink refill system, which is what I do, it's a bit of a process to refill it yourself. So there are pros and cons. Um, if you're looking into printers, this is not the video. So I would definitely do research there, but what I did was just go with a printing service. Another thing with printers, if you're gonna go with with a third party is a lot of printers offer sample packs for their paper stocks. I would highly recommend picking up, you know, a few of those depending on who you're looking at so that you can kind of like see and feel the prints in person. Print versus digital is very different. It's very important to kind of see in person the thing that you're gonna be getting instead of just like reading about it online or seeing it online. That's another reason why I went with the printer that I did is that they offer free proofs, which is essential in my opinion. Whenever you print something, you always want a proof, especially if you have things like text or, you know, kind of iffy colors on there. Getting a proof and seeing the print in person, you'll be able to like hold it and feel the size and like read the text and, and you can make decisions based on that. And then additionally, I did some research about uh, shipping platforms and website platforms. There's lots of different options for e-commerce websites. Most people use, I think, either Squarespace, Shopify, or I think Wix. Some people use Wix, maybe. I ended up going with Squarespace just because I already have a portfolio website hosted on Squarespace. I'm most familiar with building websites on Squarespace and I just didn't want to pay for another uh, website and another domain. Um, I would rather just attach my shop onto the domain and website that I already have. And then for shipping platforms, there's lots. There's like ShipStation, Shippo, there's more that I can't think of. I went with Shippo just because some of the other art shop people recommended it that I was kind of looking into and researching and I don't know, it just seemed like a good choice to me. I'll speak more about these things later. And yeah, again, just paying attention to what other people are doing. Pricing would be good to collect data on at this point. And so with all of this research, I started keeping like a spreadsheet and like some Notion pages um, just to keep track of things that I needed, comparing prices, comparing what people offered, comparing shipping platforms, all of that data just in one place on one spreadsheet kind of thing so that it's easy to get a grasp of and then you can kind of make a decision based on that. Okay, now getting into the fun stuff. Uh, <laughs> I'm a brand girly. <laughs> 
my background is in illustration as well as graphic design and I've worked at branding agencies and with branding agencies before. So branding is always a fun piece of the pie. So yeah, shop brand and collateral. This is kind of when you start to think about what you want your shop to look like, what you want the shopping experience to be, how you want to brand your packing materials, things like that. So yeah, I branded my shop. I already had an existing kind of like brand for myself that I put on like my invoices and quotes and documents and things like that and on my website. So I knew I wanted sort of like an evolution of that, but something that felt a little bit more like handmade and friendly and kind of like artisan. So yeah, I took my freelance business logo and then I kind of like morphed it and softened it into more of like a stamp kind of shape. Very round, very like <laughs> cute and handmade looking. And I feel like that matched the vibe of what I wanted my shop to be much more than this like very professional kind of clean cut crisp line logo, if that makes sense. And then taking that, I chose fonts, I chose colors, and then I thought about any extra visual language or anything that I wanted to use within my brand. And then taking those decisions, I put them all on like this very concise uh, kind of one pager so that that will inform any new things that I make for my shop. And then the brand being created and finished, I went on to make some shop collateral. So depending on what you wanna invest in, depending on how involved you want your packages to be, some people get like branded tissue paper or washi tape um, for their packing. I just did branded thank you cards. I knew that I wanted to hand write my thank you cards because I think that's just like very sweet and cute and it kind of matched the vibe of what I wanted my shop to be in terms of like a single person running it kind of thing, not like a business or a corporation. So these ones I did print and cut myself just on my printer because I have it and I already have paper here and I just wanted to use what I had. So I was willing to kind of go through the process of doing that. Plus they're just thank you cards so they didn't need to be cut exactly perfectly. And then as well, I wanted a rubber stamp for my packages, um, for my envelopes. I know some people do like stickers and things like that. And I do have stickers from my previous attempts at opening my shop, which I was kind of using through and uh, trying to get rid of. But I also wanted a stamp that said, do not bend, which is essential for envelopes if you're gonna be shipping out flat envelopes and not uh, shipping tubes. So yeah, I branded a little rubber stamp design for myself to use on my envelopes. And this was kind of like a unnecessary added expense, but I love the look of like, like a physical rubber stamp on like craft paper or something like that. I think it's so charming and it feels very like, you know, like handmade and, and personal and whatever, which is all the things that I wanted my shop to be. So yes, I decided on splurging a little bit on it. We've planned, we've researched, we've got our shop brand and collateral, we know what it's gonna look like. And so now it's time to get down to the actual preparing and ordering of inventory. So as I said earlier, most of my items that I was selling, the art was already made. So I didn't have to really do the step of creating the art. I decided to kind of use what I had because art takes a very long time to make. And I knew that that would kind of stunt my process and kind of like make it drag on a long time. And I felt like if it dragged on too long, then I would just procrastinate doing everything. So I wanted to kind of choose the path of least resistance for myself. If you are thinking about a shop and you don't have art completed yet, I would recommend maybe focusing on the art first. Focus on making stuff that you like and that you think people might want to buy. And then once all that is done, then maybe kind of start to get into the logistics and the building and the figuring out the processes of how you will sell those things. I feel like sometimes it's hard to be both the artist and the business person. So I feel like letting myself be the artist first and getting the creative out of the way, then I could push that to the side, put it in my back pocket, and then work on the business side and really focus on how to make that effective. So yeah, like I said, stickers were the one thing that I did have to make. Luckily, art-wise, they're pretty simple. They're like small little whatevers. So I had somebody who commented in one of my shop prep videos requesting that I make a video of how to make stickers from art to print. I feel like there's not enough info there to like give it its own video. So I'm just gonna do a little segment here. 
on how to make stickers. This will just be a quick run through. I'm not really like a tutorial girly. So um, I'll just talk you through what I did. The bullet points. Step one, draw your sticker in whatever program that you want and export it on a transparent background. So like a PNG, something like that. Step two, add your border slash buffer around your sticker. Most stickers have this where it's like the art and then there's some space around it for the die line to cut. Draw that shape out as a solid shape <laughs> and then export it as a black PNG on transparent or a black and white JPEG or whatever. What you need here is just a uh, contrast. Import your art transparent PNG and your border shape into Adobe Illustrator or another program that allows you to like image trace and turn things into vectors. Make sure that the file that you're working in is in CMYK for print and double check the size of your artboard and make sure it's consistent with the size of the sticker that you're trying to print. So take your border shape image and image trace it. In Illustrator, there's a little thing when you select an image at the top bar that says image trace, and then you can kind of go into like a detail panel and mess with the sliders a little bit so that it, it creates the shape that you want. Make sure you select the uh, preset black and white logo and then it'll do like a two color kind of contrast shape thing. And then expand that and turn the vector shape into an outline. Make it like a bright color, like a cyan or magenta, and then put it on a separate layer above your art and label that cut line. And then take that border shape, copy it, and then paste it back where it was, and then expand the shape. In Illustrator, I think you can go to object shape offset or something, and then um, add 0 0.125 inches expanding, um, and that will act as your bleed. So if you want uh, to print something full bleed, then the color needs to go past the cut line. So this is what this will be. And then you put it on its own layer, and then you put it underneath the art. So <laughs> the layers, there should be three layers and they should be cut line, art, and bleed. Export this file as an AI or a maximum compatibility high quality print PDF, just a, a file type that your printer can go into and see the layers, and then submit it to your printer and let them know any details. It's always best to communicate everything twice to a printer to make sure you're both on the same page. Things to list out if you're just typing up an email is the size, that it's a die cut sticker, if it's a die cut sticker, um, and what the bleed is on there. So you can let them know that there's a 0 0.125 inch bleed. A lot of sticker printers or places that do like die cut stickers will have templates. So check whatever printer you're going with on their website. And then yeah, your printer prints it and they send it to you and then you have stickers. And then for my postcards and prints, um, I took the already made art, imported it into Illustrator, and then just set up that file with, again, a 0 0.125 inch bleed and exported them as high quality PDFs with trim marks. Because I was making my postcards and prints full bleed, I needed the bleed included there. So depending on if you want like a white border around it, you can format your prints however you want. If you don't know how to do any of this, usually printers will have like design services or something. So you can just send them your art file and then tell them what you want and they can help you with that. So like I said before, the printer that I went with offered free proofs and that was one of the major things that helped me decide on picking them. So once you have your digital print files, send them to your printer and ask for proofs, physical proofs, if you can. Then when you get the proofs, like I said, you are you can touch it, you can feel it, you can look at the colors. Colors vary a lot from digital to, to screen. Digital is in RGB, which is light-based color, and CMYK is not that. <laughs> It's based on layering colors. So RGB will always look brighter and more saturated and CMYK a little bit more dull and a little bit more dark. So yeah, being able to see it in person, you'll kind of get an idea of like, okay, if that is what it looks like on digital and then that's what it looks like printed, then I know I need to like brighten it a little bit or uh, increase the saturation a little bit and then send it to print again and then I'll see it again and then it'll be better, hopefully. <laughs> That's kind of what you do with proofs. That's the point of proofing is that you can kind of see the difference between digital and physical print and then make changes based on that. 
So a few printing tips. If you've never printed before, mm, printing can be a little complicated, but you'll kind of like figure it out as you go and pick things up. Um, if you have any questions, the best people to ask are your printers. Each print shop have different processes and things like that, so they would be the most knowledgeable. But a few general tips is that, again, printers print in CMYK unless they do very like specialized like Pantone spot color things, which I feel like most people don't go with because it's pretty expensive. Print files should always be converted to CMYK. I think some printers charge like an extra fee if they need to like mess with your files or anything like that. And as well, being able to see your files in CMYK versus RGB, um, CMYK files kind of like dim color spaces a little bit and like limit it so that what you see on screen is a little bit closer to what you might see in print. And again, like I said, inks tend to print a little darker and duller than what you see on screen, especially with like super dark colors. So a good rule of thumb is like, if your image is like super dark, I would brighten it and boost the saturation a little bit to try and get that same effect in print as your original file. For very dark images and dark prints, I would go with a coated paper. Uncoated gives you like a nice matte texture and it's not like too glossy or anything. But if you think of like um, photo paper and things like that, paper that photographers print on, or like when you print like film photos and things like that, it's very highly glossy because the gloss coated papers just like hold colors a lot better and you'll get like deeper, richer, more vibrant tones than you would with an uncoated. So again, this is where, you know, getting paper stock packs, sample packs from your printers and ordering proofs is very important. With my last round of proofs, I actually took those and sold them. So I cut them myself and I put them into packs. And then, so those were the discounted proof packs that did really well. So if you do get proofs and like the last round where they look good and, and you're happy with them, you can also take those and sell them at a discount for a little extra profit. And so yes, once I was happy with my proofs and I ordered my full inventory and received it, I went through every single print. And first of all, I counted them for inventory. I put them on a spreadsheet to keep track of how many I had. And then as I was going through, I was taking out and filtering any B grade or any damaged prints. Um, and a lot of shops do this. You can take the kind of like subpar quality prints and sell them at a discount. And then with my inventory, I set up a SKU system. I'm not like super 100% clear on what this is used for. It hasn't come in handy yet, but it's a good practice, I think, for e-commerce and just like keeping track of inventory in general. So yeah, how I do my SKU codes, and you can like do a little bit more research about this on your own. There's a bunch of ways to do it, I think. But basically what I did was just like create little codes for different identifiers for each product and then put it together to make my SKU. So this is how I do it. I numbered each of my products from one to whatever. I gave each of them a little code based on what it was. So for example, PC was for postcard, SK was for sticker. And then I took into account their size. So for prints, I had different sizes of different items. So nine by 12 would be 912, five by seven would be 057. And then I made codes for where each item was produced. So for example, my prints were printed at Little Rock, so their code was LR. And then my stickers were Jukebox, so the code was JB. And then I took all of these things together and that was my SKU. <laughs> so for example, PT912LR010 is print nine by 12, Little Rock, product number 10. So once you come up with that system, it kind of like helps you organize it, I guess, and gives you a snapshot of what that thing is. So shipping materials. I kind of just bought all of these over time as I was doing this whole process, just buying whatever I needed whenever I thought of it. I bought most of my shipping materials from either Amazon or Uline, which is a local supplier of shipping goods in my province, but I think they have locations in like the States and things like that as well. But again, do, do your own research and see what's available to you. So this is what I got. I got stay flat mailers uh, at a nine by 12 size and a six by eight size for larger orders with prints. I would use the nine by 12 and the six by eight would be for like postcard and sticker only orders. And then I got smaller unstructured mailers, just like regular envelopes for sticker only orders. If you are getting small envelopes for like, if you're only planning on selling stickers and things like that, I would check the regulations in your area about like mail sizes because most places do have a minimum 
mail envelope size. So you can't just get like a teeny tiny envelope like this. It needs to be a certain size. And then I got poly sleeves for both sizes of my envelopes, the nine by 12 and the six by eight. And this was just to create a protection layer against any moisture for my paper goods. I got a thermal printer for my shipping labels and any like address labels that I needed to print as well as the thermal labels themselves. I used the Munbin P941, which seems to be a, a pretty popular label printer, works great. I got a bunch of stamps for letter mail. I'll talk more about that later on. I got a Munbin postal mail scale for weighing my packages. Um, you need that information for uh, filling out custom forms on shipping labels. And in this same category is my branded rubber stamp and a ink pad for that. Okay. Let's talk about website. Ooh. <clears throat> so, like I said, I went with Squarespace. I'm gonna be speaking to specifically the Squarespace experience. I'm sure some details and settings and things like that will vary platform to platform, but this is just what I did. So in terms of selling on your own website versus on a platform like Etsy, there are pros and cons to both. You know, for Etsy, I feel like the appeal there is obviously like it's a huge search engine and lots of people shop on Etsy anyways. It's a place where lots of people go when they want to find handmade kind of like artisan things. So there's lots of market there. There's potential to make lots of sales without having to do much of your own marketing. But the reason why I didn't go with Etsy was because they obviously need to take some of your sales in fees. Um, there's a lot of competition on there and it kind of seems like there's certain things about like your products, like, if you don't offer free shipping, then your item won't do as well and things like that. A lot of decisions need to be made to keep up with the standard of what's going on on Etsy. And so with the perspective in mind of like, I just want something personal and something that will grow with me and something that I really don't care about how many sales I get from, I decided to go on with hosting my own shop. I feel like personally, when whenever I wanna buy art, I buy directly from specific artists that I follow and people that I wanna support. So from that perspective, I would prefer that the people who bought from me are already a fan of me and really like my art to the point that they would buy it rather than just somebody looking for some random art on Etsy. So yeah, there's a balance, you know, the, the potential is huge for Etsy, but also it's very easy to get buried in everything else that's on there. And then for your own shop, you need to do all of the marketing yourself because nobody's just gonna stumble upon your shop just cruising the internet. Most likely you need to let people know that you're selling things and get people to come to your website. So building the site itself was pretty simple for me just because I'm pretty well versed in, you know, building websites on Squarespace. Squarespace does have tons of templates. It's one of the easiest website builders, I would think on the market. And I think like a simple shop page is better if you're not familiar with website building or UI design or things like that. I would just kind of like go to other e-commerce shops and kind of take notes of how other people do it. Or you could even just like copy people's layouts one for one, that's a thing. <laughs> um, or just stick to what the template is. The most important thing with designing a e-commerce shop page is easy accessibility, making sure that putting yourself in the customer's shoes, thinking about the customer flow, thinking about what people are gonna be looking for when they go to your shop and can they find it easily and quickly. So yeah, for me, since my inventory was gonna be pretty small to launch um, and I wanted to keep everything super simple, I just went with one singular shop page. So one main shop page with my shop brand, any information or announcements I needed, and then the section with all of my products listed just on a single page altogether, listed in the order of what I wanted people to buy top to bottom <laughs> or what I thought was gonna be popular. And then underneath that was an FAQ section. So all of the things that you would need on a single page, easy to find, no chance of getting lost. You could, if you wanted to, if you're planning on launching with a bit more of like a fleshed out inventory, a lot of people divide up their products by type, like stickers, or if you have things on sale, you can sort by that, just like the typical e-commerce experience. But yeah, for me, I thought less is more, so I kept it very simple. And then for the item pages themselves, those were also very simple. I feel like Squarespace 
they have different templates for the item pages and you can't really customize much away from that, which is fine. You know, the for, for an item shop page, all you really need is like a place for an image and then a place for your details and then your like add to cart or whatever. And then on Squarespace, their checkout flow is super limited in terms of what you can do to customize it, I think for security reasons. So for like the cart page, the checkout page, the checkout flow, um, customer emails, things like that, it was all very simple, just like brand colors, brand fonts, logo, you know, you really don't need much more than that. Yeah, so the FAQ section. This is very important. Most shops have this. Every shop that I've researched, especially like something run by a single person or like a very small business, um, will have an FAQ section. So I would highly recommend, you know, going to those other shops that you're looking at and researching and seeing what they include in their FAQ section. Um, you can go to my shop page if you want to and see what questions I have answered there, what information that I provide. Usually it's things like shipping times, uh, return policy, shipping locations, just like very technical things, what to do if your package goes missing, things like that. Um, and always remember to include another contact email if people have questions that aren't answered in your FAQ. And then this is a good place to link your uh, socials and your other links that you wanna include as well, if not already in your um, top nav bar. So Squarespace has integrated customer notifications. So things like when people buy your item, they'll get an email notification that the order is confirmed or when it ships, your order has shipped, here's your tracking number, that kind of thing. So it's, uh, it's a nice, easy, seamless integration. You can customize it to include your logo, your fonts, your colors, whatever, things like that. I think you can edit messaging as well. And then on the footer, um, it's a good idea to include your return policy if you have one and a link to your FAQ section. So one tip for the email notifications on Squarespace, you can change your reply to email and your from email. Your reply to email should definitely be, I think it automatically is linked to whatever email you have attached to your Squarespace account. But the, the like from email will automatically be from like no reply at Squarespace or whatever. Unless you have an email that is custom. So like it would be like shop at leechats.com for me instead of like shop leechats at Outlook or Hotmail or Gmail or whatever. If you have that already, then it should be safe to use that email as the from address. But if you don't, I would recommend keeping the default Squarespace address. A lot of email inbox filtering systems will filter out emails from public email systems emails like Gmail, Outlook, things like that. So if you use a email that isn't a custom domain email, you'll run the risk of all of your email confirmations and shipping confirmations and things like that ending up in people's junk folders. And speaking of emails, when you get an order, when your shop is launched and you get your first order and multiple orders after that, hopefully, Squarespace by default will send you shop notification emails to the email address uh, attached to your Squarespace account. This is fine if you're cool with that, if your Squarespace email is already signed up with um, an email that you made specifically for your shop. But if you use your like personal email or the email that you use for everything, then that means when you start getting orders, all of the order email notification emails will be flooding your inbox. I'm sure there are ways to like filter that out or whatever in like with like smart mailboxes or whatever. Personally, I wanted a separate shop email for my shop and I wanted all of the notifications to go to that email. So the way to do that, if you've already created your website or your shop um, with a personal email, you have to make your shop email its own Squarespace account. And then you have to invite that email to your website to be a contributor. And then once that's in there, then you can turn off shop order notification emails to your personal email and then turn them on for this new contributor email, which will be solely for your shop. Having this dedicated shop email attached to my uh, shop was very helpful. And so every time I got a new order, it ended up in that inbox. And then it was a good way to keep track of which ones I had sent out and which ones were done and being fulfilled. Other than what Squarespace provides in their, their dashboard of keeping track of orders and things like that. It was nice to have an inbox where once the item was shipped out and I didn't have to worry about it anymore, um, I could just delete that email notification from my inbox. And another thing with the checkout process is that Squarespace, and I think I'm sure other places allow you to do this as well, there's an option to have an email sign up 
in the checkout flow. So this is a very good practice for e-commerce is to collect the emails of your customers and sign them up to some sort of newsletter or email list. For me, I linked a MailChimp account to my Squarespace email list so that anybody who does want to sign up for like a newsletter or whatever, who is a previous customer, I can send out newsletters to them whenever I have like a shop update or any announcements or notifications that I want specifically my customers to know. Email marketing is very effective. Yeah, it's highly recommended that, you know, when you have the opportunity to get somebody's email so that you can, you know, let them know of things in the future, um, you should definitely take advantage of that. On Squarespace, there's a option to have that already checked um, so that when people like go through the process, they don't have to like click, yes, I want to sign up for your newsletter. The default will be already checked and then they have to uncheck it if they don't want any newsletters. So leaving it at that um, is better. <laughs> so once you have all of your inventory in from your printers and you've counted them and you've sorted them, now you can take some photos. So there's a few ways that you can do this. Um, again, it's good to like research and see what other e-commerce websites are doing or just like looking for inspiration on Etsy. Sorry, looking for inspiration on Pinterest uh, or Etsy, Etsy's good too. And kind of deciding the style of photography that you wanna do. I know a lot of people do like things like flat lays where it's just like very straight down, very clean cut. Um, you could use mock-ups if you want to, this one, Depending on the mock-up that you find, a lot of mock-ups kind of look like shit, but if you can find, you know, a few that look good and don't really look like mock-ups, then go ahead. The thing with mock-ups is that you don't want to be kind of like false advertising what your prints are going to look like, especially if the digital version and the print version look a little different. Um, it's better to photograph the actual print. Or what I've seen a lot of shops do or um, what I did personally was I took more of like a casual approach to the product photography. I think especially like the vibe that I was going for with my shop, it being very like personal and like small businessy and like a single person runs this, those kinds of, kinds of descriptors. Um, I wanted the photos to feel like that as well. So I kind of just went for like holding up the product with my hand or just like dressing it up around my office and like putting like props and stuff like that and just taking pictures with my iPhone. And I think that was like the most charming option. It's the one that I like the most. So that's what I went with. So do your best with what you have. You by no means need like a professional studio setup or anything like that. The photos should just show your product clearly and in hopefully a positive light. So yeah, I shot all of my photos on my iPhone 14 Pro Max, just with the cameras, they're great. They're all you need. And then tweaked, brightened, up to contrast, up to sharpness, things like that in Lightroom. And then if you want to, and it matches the vibe of your shop, you can take those exports of your photos and like add little personalized like drawings or captions on them. That's what I did with some of mine. Um, I thought it would be nice to like write postcard on each of my postcard photos just to differentiate them, postcard versus print. And then for stickers, I thought that would be fun as well. It's a nice little way to like customize and make them feel like more you, I guess. And then so once you have your photos already and prepped, you can add them to your uh, product listing pages on your website for the listing descriptions and things like that. Again, I looked at what other people were doing, what kind of information is good to put there. And so these are uh, some of the listing details that I put. So first line, I put a little description of what the product is. Like if it's a postcard, then first of all, the title will say postcard in it. And then the first line of the descriptor would be like, if the postcard had a caption on it, then I would put the caption there. And then underneath I have size, material, so like what kind of paper stock it is, the thickness, um, if it's matte or glossy, things like that. And then underneath I just reiterate what it is. So it's a double-sided postcard or mini print. Or if it's a sticker, then I say sticker, blah, blah, blah. Any details that um, you can get from your printer about like what it's made from, how durable it is, um, how to care for it, if it's something that you need to care for, things like that. And then underneath that, some shipping information. So shipped in a sturdy mailer with a do not bend stamp so that people know that you're trying your best. <laughs> and then on every product listing page, I include a link to my FAQ. So if there's anything else that they wanna know, then there's an easy way to you know see if there's some more answers somewhere else. Are we tired yet, guys? <laughs> it's gonna be a long video. Okay. <laughs>
Let's talk about pricing. So for art, I feel like pricing is always kind of hard. Maybe a little less so for things like prints and things because you can, there's always comparables. So what I did to price my products, I did a combination of, again, researching, seeing what else is on the market, seeing how other people price their products if they're similar to mine. Looking at Etsy is like kind of good. I know like Etsy is kind of notorious for making people feel like they need to price very low to be competitive. So just kind of balance out what other people are doing with what you think makes sense for how much time and effort you've put into it. For things like prints, it's easier to, you know, price a little lower because they are just copies um, and you can sell a bunch of them. Just kind of, I don't know, look around, but also, you know, price it at something that makes you feel, you know, like it's fair and you're getting paid a fair amount. So for all of my products, I put them in a little spreadsheet and then I did a column for how much it costs to produce that item. And then I decided on like a price that I wanted maybe, and then another column for profit. So I can see how much I'll be getting per item sold. These profit figures and expense figures do not take into account things that were like an, a larger upfront overhead cost, things like renting a PO box, my website subscription fees. The cost just kind of includes the price that it took to produce that item, as well as uh, a little bit extra for like envelope and um, poly bag or whatever. So yeah, it just needs to be a balance of what you think is fair, what you think people will think it's, is fair and be happy to pay for that item. So things like prints, even though it doesn't cost too, too much to produce, like it's just a print basically, it is just a print. <laughs> you can price it a little, a little higher depending on the size because perceived value, I guess, if you're getting a bigger thing, you feel like it's worth it to spend more money on. So yeah, as you can see, my highest profit item were my prints. Like I was talking about, these are my largest items. I looked around, you know, to see how other people were pricing prints around that size, kind of like letter size, nine by 12 kind of vibe. And it seemed like, you know, it prints would go for around like 15 bucks USD per. So I was pricing all of my stuff in Canadian dollars. So I just decided at 18 per, and I thought that was fair. And then on the other end, my lowest profit items were my stickers, because again, um, I talked about this, the sticker production process is just more expensive. Getting that vinyl material printed and die cut um, is a little bit more pricey, while at the same time, um, stickers are kind of like the type of product that you expect to be one of the cheapest. So in my research, it kind of seemed like stickers would go for like three to five USD. So I felt like my sticker prices needed to be relatively low. I kept them as low as I, you know, could $5 profit per set. It's not much, um, but you know, at the end of the day, stickers are cheap little things. Often people give away stickers for free. So I feel like their value is perceived as low. So it's hard to justify a harder price tag just because the production is higher. And stickers tend to be like a easy thing to just like throw in your cart. Um, stickers are usually like a pretty popular item. So you're kind of banking on the hope that if you price your stickers slightly lower, um, stickers are already a popular item. So lots of people will buy them. So it'll be worth it, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Again, I'm not an e-commerce e girly. I'm not um, a pro at this. So that's just what I did. <laughs> Okay, let's get into the fun stuff. Expenses. <laughs> Not much to say here. I thought I would spend around a grand in expenses and investing in things and upfront costs to launch my shop. And I went over that. <laughs> so here's the breakdown of all of the expenses that I had from starting the shop lunch launch journey slash process to launching. So a lot of these are like big upfront costs. So things like mailers, poly uh, slips, bags, whatever, things like that come in you know, large quantities and you're not gonna need all of that for your initial launch. But over time, you'll kind of like get your value back out of that and make your money back. And you know, buying larger things upfront usually is a larger upfront cost, but it'll result in a uh, cheaper per item in the long run. And then things like your website fees and your PO box rental, like those things last you an entire year. So depending on how many shop openings you do or how many things and sales that you do, it kind of is an ongoing thing that, um, you know, depending on how much you put into it in a certain amount of time will depend on, you know, what the value is there for you. In total, I spent 
$1,702. And during my launch shop opening, I got 51 orders, which resulted in 1,164 in sales. So meaning I'm still $538 in the red, which is fine. You know, I talked about this in my post shop launch video, in my reflections video, if you wanna go watch that after this one. When I was, you know, spending all this money on these expenses for my shop and like building it and opening it, I was kind of like happy to spend this money. It felt like I was just like buying things that I wanted to buy anyways because I was investing this money into something that I really wanted to do and really wanted to build and was excited to have, you know? So I don't really see this negative number as something that I need to make back right away. It's just kind of where I am. It's good data to have. It's good to keep track of your expenses and things like that. But yeah, I don't think it's a very big deal. I think it's like already astonishing that I, you know, had so much in sales. I was not expecting that at all. So yeah, that's the end of the expenses segment. <laughs> okay, guys, I'm sorry. It's time to talk about shipping, logistics, taxes, and just like accounting and all that fucking boring bullshit. This section is probably like the most overwhelming uh, part because I feel like it's it's very difficult to find accurate information on this stuff because it's so specific to where you live and it's very high stakes because if you mess stuff like this up, especially like taxes, things to do with like your government tax program, you can get in a lot of shit. So yeah, I'm gonna try and go through these quickly. I have a lot of points here. And just so you guys know, to reiterate, I live in Canada, so our tax laws while I think pretty similar to the States and other places, they are specific to Canadians and specifically in Alberta where I live, it's all different. So for things like taxes and accounting and things like that, you need to do your own research based on where you live and find out like things like tax brackets and like sales tax things and whatever, we'll, we'll get into it. But yeah, I am not an accountant. I am not a tax professional. Do not take this as professional tax advice financial advice, whatever else. This is just my experience, what I did to hopefully help you get a better understanding of it, but you need to do your own research. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's what it is. Okay, so shipping, let's get into shipping. So like I said before, I use Shippo for my labels. Um, Shippo is literally just like an integration that you can connect with your website that pushes orders through your e-commerce website to its a uh, shipping program thing. So it shows up in Shippo and then you can click on it and then it automatically brings over the information where you can put it into a shipping label. So Shippo is basically literally just like a service that like searches a bunch of different shipping rates with different shipping providers. Like for me, Canada Post, UPS, FedEx, things like that. Um, and then shows you the prices and then you can choose the shipping platform right within their interface and buy it through there. And then they give you the label and then you can print it. It's all very like seamless and nice. It's kept all in one place and I like it a lot. It worked for me. And then, so on Squarespace specifically, you need to set up shipping profiles and fulfillment profiles for your e-commerce shop. So I'm not sure, I think Shopify has live rates available. I think maybe Squarespace has live rates like in the States or something. But for me, I had to set flat rates. So depending on where people were buying from, I kind of had to just do research based on like random addresses around the world, seeing how much it would cost to ship to different places and then create shipping profiles to match that. So for example, if somebody is ordering from Canada, then I'll give them two separate shipping options, one untracked and one tracked. And then I'll do research on how much it costs to send to like Quebec versus BC, and then kind of like settle on a good kind of average that I'm willing to state for my flat rate. And then, so those will be the shipping options that show up for somebody shopping within Canada. If you're shopping from the States, then you'll have different options. If you're shopping international, then different options again. It's just so that you can set rates based on how much shipping will cost, based on how far away people live from you. And then fulfillment profiles are for different sizes of packages, because if some, if two people are ordering from like Florida, 
say. And one of them is ordering a bunch of prints, so it needs to come in a 9x12 mailer, and one of them is ordering just postcards or just stickers. The cost of shipping will be pretty different if the size is pretty different and the weight especially. So you kind of need to set different profiles for what people will buy so that they get different shipping options when they check out. So for example, on my shop, if you're ordering just stickers, then I know that I can send it in one of my small normal mailers and it'll be super light. So I include a extra option for uh, sticker shipping, which is much cheaper. So it's things like that you can add options for uh, with fulfillment profiles. And all of this you can just mess with in um, Squarespace's settings and backends. If you go settings and then selling, all of it's listed there. So for shipping, um, on Squarespace at least, you need to add manual shipping zones. So these shipping zones will be kind of attached to whatever shipping profiles that you have. So Canada is just Canada, US is just US, and then everybody else is international. Because based on my testing and basing on, based on my like test shipping labels that I was um, playing with in Shippo, just to look at rates, whether I'm shipping to Germany, shout out my German, viewers <laughs> or japan it's the same ish price so um i felt comfortable doing just a single flat rate for anybody international if that's different for you then you can make more shipping profiles but yeah within the international one i had to add countries individually so right now geez i don't know i don't know how many countries i have on there but um one of my things listed in my faq se section and something that i've noticed lots of shop owners do is if somebody's country is not available to ship to, they just need to be added to their shipping zone so they can contact and be like, hey, I'm from this place and I can't buy from your shop. Can you add me? And you can say, yes, I will add you. So customs, customs, customs. So I'm pretty sure this is a, this is a rule anywhere, but if you ship internationally, you need to include a customs form on your package. So Shippo is great and I feel like any shipping integration thing is great for this because they have that all included in the process. So when an order comes through from an international order or even from the states, for me, it comes in through Shippo, you click create label and then it'll ask you a bunch of questions to include on your customs form. When a package from another country comes in, it goes through customs and depending on what's inside it, depending on the value of the goods inside, they might need to like charge extra fees or whatever. So that's what that's for. You need to include very specific descriptions of what is in each package, accurate weights, accurate values, um, so that when it arrives at the customs office of whatever country you're shipping to, there's no issues there and it doesn't get held up. But within Canada, and I think it's the same for the States and maybe other countries, I'm sure, you can mail anything through letter mail, which is just regular envelope mail with stamps. And that's a cheaper shipping option. And P.O. boxes. Yeah, I highly recommend getting a P.O. box. I think that is just necessary for, you know, keeping your home address private. Anything that you mail out needs to have a return address and if you are, you know, a small business owner, if you're just like doing this out of your house, then that's gonna be your house address, unless you have a PO box. So for the sake of, you know, not doxing yourself, the safest thing to do is to rent a PO box. In Canada, you know, with through, through Canada Post, it's pretty inexpensive. I think it was like 190 for a year and that's like fine. And then if, you know, any packages go missing or things need to be returned to you because they, you know, couldn't get pa past customs or whatever, they go to your PO box. So yeah, <sighs> safety is, you know, good. You don't want to be sending your address to anybody who buys a sticker from you, you know? <laughs> and then payment processing. So payment processing is pretty simple on Squarespace. Um, I use Stripe. I think there's an option of using Stripe or Square or like other payment processing, there's PayPal as well. But yeah, with this, whatever website builder that you're using, you just like search it up in the little integrations tab or whatever, and then make your Stripe account or Square account, and then um, you just link it. And then you link that payment processor to your bank account or whatever, wherever you wanna get your payouts. Okay, so taxes, where do I start? Okay, so I am self-employed. All of my income is self-employment income. So none of it comes from an employer who deducts taxes for me. So any income that you make on the side, you need to claim on your tax report and you need to pay taxes on it. 
income tax. So depending on where you live and depending how much money you make, you will need to pay different amounts of taxes. So whatever tax bracket you belong in. This is all very basic, I'm sure you know this. And if you don't, that's fine. They don't teach us taxes in school and they fucking should. <laughs> Why don't they? So yeah, that's the first thing. If you're gonna be selling items online, if you're gonna be making side income, you need to set aside a certain percentage of that income for taxes. So the way that it works is that whatever expenses that you have or whatever money that you spend investing in this business and for business purposes, keep those receipts, keep track of those expenses. You can deduct that amount from the sales that you make so that you're only paying taxes on the profit, if that makes sense. Where I live, I set aside 30% of whatever income that I make minus the expenses. Even plus the expenses, I just set aside 30% to be safe. And then come tax time, you need to declare how much you've spent in expenses, declare how much income you've made, and then it'll give you a number of how much you need to pay in taxes. That's the very basic, um, you know, watered down version of how that works. So in Canada, if you make more than $30,000 a year, in self-employment income or from your own business, you need to register for a GST number and you need to charge sales tax on your goods. I don't know how it works in the States. I don't know if there's a threshold there or what. Please do your own research. But for Canada, Canada is pretty good. It's pretty easy because we only have 13 provinces and territories. And so for each province or territory, you need to charge um, the sales tax that correlates to that province. So for Alberta, we only pay GST, so sales tax for people shopping within Alberta is 5%. Whereas BC, they pay GST and PST, and I think it's like 15% or something? It's a lot. <laughs> but yeah, so each province has its own sales tax thingy. And then, so Squarespace will let you manually set all of your different tax amounts based on where people are shopping from. I think in the States, there's an integration called Tax Jar that does all of that calculating for you because I think in the States, like even like zip code to zip code, sometimes the tax percentages can be different. So, you know, hopefully that is good and works for all of you American uh, viewers and potential shop owners. But yeah, so it's pretty simple. Um, I think there is a good article uh, by like TurboTax or something. Find like a reputable tax publication or something to get this information of what the tax amounts for each province is. And then you can um, input that in manually for Canada. And then again, all of that money in sales tax that you're charging needs to be paid back to the CRA or to the IRA. Is that what the American one is? So just, just you know, if you can talk to an accountant, that would be good. If you have an accountant that does your taxes regularly, you can ask them or just like do tons of research and there's lots of resources out there. It's all very um, specific to your circumstance, how much money you make and where you live. So yeah, personally, I use QuickBooks Self-Employed. I don't know if that's available in the States or if that's just a Canadian thing, but that has been such a breeze to use. It's been a lifesaver. Any sort of expense tracking, accounting uh, service like that would be good to have, um, especially if, you know, what you're selling requires you to buy a lot of things, have a lot of expenses, or you're getting lots of income from it. Using a service that tracks all of that and like you can upload receipts to and keep track of makes just tax time much less stressful. And yeah, I hope, you know, this tax section didn't overwhelm you too much. This part was the most uh, anxiety inducing and stressful part of the whole shop opening process. For some reason, it's so hard to find good, clear information on how to do your taxes <laughs> and like how fucking tax systems work and things like that. But I feel like especially coming from me where I like think I have it figured out, it's hard to know if that's 100% true. So anything that I say, I'm saying with like a huge disclaimer, a huge caveat of like, this is what I think is right. And this is what I'm doing. I could be wrong. So don't take my word for it. <laughs> so like you don't want to lead people astray and be responsible for that. So yeah, please do your own research. Talk to other people, you know, ask them what they do. This is what I do. Um, and yeah. So let's talk about marketing, guys. 
is marketing, 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 marketing. If you watch my shop prep vlog series, you know my opinion on marketing. Um, not a fan when it comes to like client work and things like that. Any like overtly marketing based projects or like ad production or things like that are always like the most like uh, projects. Cause like, I don't like marketing. I don't like being marketed to. I feel like that's the general consensus of everyone, you know? So I did very minimal marketing uh, for my shop. It's, it's kind of like a difficult thing because marketing undoubtedly is extremely important for sales. People aren't gonna buy your product unless they know that it exists and they won't know that it exists unless you tell them that it exists. So the way that I kind of balanced out, you know, not wanting to overtly just like advertise my products to people while still, you know, getting the word out there that I have a shop and that I'm selling things and come check it out was that I was trying to make my marketing as as not like overtly advertisey as possible. Like whatever I did to show that I was like selling stuff or whatever, I wanted to provide something else, whether that be entertainment or humor or a story or whatever. So the primary way that I marketed this whole shop was through YouTube. I was doing this whole vlog shop prep series or whatever as I was going. And that was a way to, you know, slowly let people follow along with my journey. And lots of people knew that like a shop opening was coming and make people like curious about it and also like show my product that I was doing. So it was a ton of work, but I feel like doing that YouTube series and that vlog series was the main reason why uh, my shop did better than I expected. Otherwise on my other platforms like Instagram and things like that, I just did like bare minimum, like 24 hours before my shop launched, I put out a story saying, hey, my shop is opening in 24 hours. Here's a little reminder thingy if you wanna get notified when it's open, see you then. And then the day of launch, I did a post and a story saying, shop's open, here's the link. And that's about it. And then a few days later, I did like a reel of just like me going through all of my products and giving them like personality types or whatever, which I thought was like a cool, funny way to go through my, my inventory and just entertain as well. So yeah, that is all that I did really for marketing and it was fine working on ads and you know trying to get people to buy my shit makes me want to shoot myself in the foot and i hate that i hate the process of it i'd much rather people you know come to my shop out of like organic curiosity from following me on instagram or watching my youtube videos or things like that you know so it's a balance do as much marketing as you're comfortable with do as much marketing as you feel like you need to depending on what your goals are for your shop. And yeah. Okay, we've done everything guys. We have got our inventory, our website's done. We figured out taxes and our shipping programs and everything like that. So now we're ready to launch. Yeah, in preparation for your launch, there are a few little checklist items that I did that um, might be helpful for you to know. So number one, Double check all of your inventory numbers. For me, I made all of my inventory stock on my website like two quantity less than what I actually had, just in case, you know, one of them gets damaged or I don't know, I just need extra. I, I, I just needed more physically than what was listed on my website, just in case. Check your payment processor your Stripe or your Square or whatever, and make sure that it's off of test mode. I think initially Stripe at least was set to test mode on and it's just like a little toggle in the corner. Make sure that's off so that it can actually take and process payments. On Squarespace, so Squarespace e-commerce has a test mode so if you want to, you can run a test order with test mode on. So it'll just like give you a dummy credit card or whatever. So it won't charge any actual money just to see if the order goes through and it, you get the email notifications and things like that. Um, you can do that a, a few times if you need to test and change things and tweak things and whatever. So once that's done, you can turn off your test mode. So with both your payment processor and your Squarespace off of test mode, then you can run an actual test order. So this is you literally pretending like you're a customer. You go in, you add what you want into your cart. You go through the checkout flow. 
you put in your actual credit card, the payment go th goes through, check your payment processor to see if the payment did go through. If that's all good, no hiccups there. And then you'll get your email confirmation and yada yada. And if that's all good, then you're good. And then you can refund your purchase or whatever. It costs like whatever the payment processing fee is of like a few cents or whatever. But I think it's a good idea to do that just to make sure everything's smooth. And then lastly, um, for your website, it's just a good idea to go through, do a very thorough comb through, run through of all of your links, make sure everything's working on your website, make sure all of the links go where they're supposed to be, um, double check for any like, I don't know, typos, things like that, make sure it all looks great. And then you're pretty much good to launch. So launch. So for the first little while after you launch, after you've clicked launch and the orders start coming in, hopefully, it's a good idea to kind of just like sit there and be available and kind of like monitor the situation, see if anything comes up, make sure that things are going through properly, make sure people aren't like emailing you with questions and things like that. And yeah, hopefully everything goes smoothly. So once you have launched your shop and you've gotten a few orders, it's time to start packing and fulfilling. So Squarespace will list all of your orders in the selling tab of their dashboard. And then so all of them will show up there and then they'll have a like pending or fulfilled tag along with them. And then so you can click into each of those orders and then see what items need to go in each package along with like names, addresses, things like that, everything you need. Um, so this was my main way of keeping track of everything as I was packing them. So basically I would just like click the order, see what people ordered, pack it, and then set it aside. One tip for Squarespace specifically, I don't know how it is for any other platform or whatever, but when you're looking at the items listed in each order, it'll list each individual item. But if people order like multiple quantities of something, it'll just be like really small underneath it, say like quantity two or whatever. So it's an easy thing to miss. So make sure you triple check, you know, what goes in each person's order and make sure that you have the correct quantities of each item, just so that you're not like, God forbid you, you forget to include certain things in people's orders and then you have to send out something again. And another tip for orders, um, something to check every now and then before you start packing is with Stripe, I don't believe they send you notifications if an order doesn't go through or if a payment doesn't go through. So it's good to check the payments tab and look to make sure that all of them have succeeded and gone through properly um, so that you're not sending out orders that you didn't get paid for. Yeah, packing orders is a very lovely process. The first day that I, you know, was packing my initial launch orders and everything like that, um, it took me literally all day uh, to pack 30 orders. This was because, I don't know, I was figuring things out. I was handwriting all the notes. I was being super, super careful with everything, making sure that I, you know, was getting everybody's orders packed correctly. As well, I was figuring out my label printing process and my address label process, and I had to go get stamps and things like that. So there was a bunch of things. Give yourself lots of time for this first packing extravaganza because, you know, there's going to be a lot of learning curves and things here. So yeah, other than, you know, keeping track and making sure that you're getting the right quantities of items in each order and paying attention to that, triple checking every time. If you're packing a large batch, it's a good idea to count in your system, in your Squarespace order page or whatever, how many orders you're going to be packing and then keep that number, you know, clear somewhere pack all of those orders. And then once you're done packing, have all of your packed orders in one place and then count that number again to make sure that you didn't lose any in the process or you didn't miss any, or you didn't do an extra one by accident, one that came in later and make sure that the, the number, you know, just stays consistent. So for labels, shipping labels, address labels, always double, triple check the address, the names, everything especially if you're writing these manually or doing a data transfer, if you're not getting the um, information straight from Squarespace into Shippo into the shipping label, like if it's not automated, um, make sure you're extra careful with these. So for orders that didn't require a shipping label, so for anybody that ordered via letter mail, I use just like a little address sticker that had like written their address on it. So no like automated shipping scannable label or anything like that. And so to do that in a way that was fast, um, there's a way through Squarespace to export all of your order data um, into a CSV document where it 
basically makes a spreadsheet of all the info of all of the orders. And then there's a way to take that data and then input it so that it automates through Adobe InDesign, if you know how to use InDesign or have that program, that it'll put all of the addresses for you so you don't have to copy and paste it manually. I followed a really helpful video tutorial on how to do that, which I will link in the description and also put it in the cards, I guess, um, that shows you exactly how to do that. But yes, even if you're doing this, make sure you triple, triple, double check all of the addresses after it's all imported, just like scroll through and read them and compare, just that, you know, there's no mess ups or typos or anything. Okay, and then holy fuck, that's it. You did it. Congratulations. What a journey, what a time. So yeah, post-launch. Um, if you're interested, like I said, I have that post-launch reflections video that I made after I, you know, finished my whole shop update. I was like super fresh after, you know, the launch and whatever. So I shared the feelings that I had and any other reflections. Go check that out if you want to. All in all, it took me about a month I think to, you know, go from beginning to end from I'm gonna launch my art shop to launch. And like I said, it took me uh, $1,700 to get there. So I had my shop up and running for about three weeks and I got 51 orders and then I closed it for the holidays. I launched my shop, I think on December 1st and then I closed it on the 23rd or something like that. I decided to go with the format, the shop business format of doing periodic shop openings. I feel like a lot of specifically small art business shops do this because, you know, it takes time, it takes effort to maintain a shop um, when you get new orders in and whatever else, it, it's just like a mental weight there. So being able to close your shop every once in a while so you can focus on making new art or thinking about your next launch or like doing things in more of like a periodic kind of like seasonal format is, it works for me. I like it better than if it was just like open all the time. So. Yeah, take that into consideration what you want to do there. So yeah, since my first opening, um, it's been over a month now that it's been closed and I really haven't thought about what I want to do next. I've, I'm, I'm starting to kind of like think about, you know, what my next shop opening will be and what I want to do there. But yeah, having this shop, you know, be something that I know is just going to continue to exist and grow with me and just like be there whenever I'm ready for it or whenever I want to sell things really has been nice. Like not putting too much pressure on myself to constantly be like selling or marketing or you know, all of those things. So yeah, however you want to run your shop is unique to you, of course, and whatever your goals are for that. But for me personally, I like that, you know, it can just be kind of chill and I don't feel pressure to constantly be making sales or thinking of new products and just like kind of letting my shop ebb and flow with the seasons of my normal life and kind of exist to supplement me, not for me to you know, be supporting its life, it's supporting my life. I feel like it's super easy to get caught up in all of these like grand stories of like people's super successful shops and like dream about, you know, having that with anything. If you stick to it, if you, you know, maintain it, if you put a lot of effort into it, eventually, definitely, I think anyone can get there. But, you know, just be, um, be aware of where you are in your life you know, look at things, try to look at things as like a, a, a journey, as like a lifelong, maybe not lifelong, as like a long-term kind of like goal thing. And eventually with time, as you learn and as you fail and as you grow, um, you can get there. But this initial launch is mostly just a lot of learning, can be a lot of struggle, some failure, but the process as a whole is kind of better for it because of this kind of work that you're putting in now. So, yeah, <laughs> that's all guys. <sighs> that is all, holy fuck. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that this was um, good. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope that my ramblings all made sense. Again, everything is in text form below, all of my notes that I'm literally looking at right now. A checklist version of, of this whole video is down there as well. So if you, weren't taking notes during this video, it's all down there that you can reference. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments. I'll do my best to answer. Um, again, I'm not a professional or anything, but I'll, you know, let's talk, let's chat. We'll figure it out. I'll try. <laughs> and yeah, that's it.
thank you again so very much for watching. Um, good luck with your shop journey. I believe in you. Anybody can fucking do this. If I can do this, you sure as hell can do this. So good luck. Be nice to yourself. Take your time if you need to. It doesn't all have to come together so quickly. It can be a process that you're working on over time. Just whatever, however your life is going, whatever life situations are happening right now, pay attention to you, take care of yourself, and you got this. You can do it. You can do this. Okay. I will see you guys in a bit. <laughs> oh, these talking videos are always so exhausting. It's a lot of talking. As much as I ramble, I really am not that much of a chatty Kathy. I swear. <laughs>